All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Sorry for the delay in this lecture. Um, we're going to have a couple probably get to watch. More than likely, at least two or three. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize again. Uh, it just I never had time to break away at the hospital to actually record this. So um, we'll just dive straight in. I hope it's not too boring that we're not in class together to actually have conversation, but I'll kind of just go over everything that's important. So, as you know, this week we're supposed to be going over the Apostle Paul. And, well, as I mentioned before, there is a lot that can be said and discussed about Paul. But we do not have the time to dive into much of that, especially because this is an introductory course. So, to not my delight, we will do a flyover, and I mean a brief flyover of why he's important and why some of the writings he has are <clears throat> very vital as well. And sorry if you hear background noise. Um, it's just my daughter and my wife upstairs. But it can be said that Paul is the second most important person in the Bible when it comes to Christianity. This is because his writings and life are analyzed, written, uh, are analyzed and written about how much he's done, contributed. Uh, everything about his life is uh, studied. Uh, everything from his preaching, uh, what we find in the, in the letters, uh, are broken apart piece by piece, word by word. And besides any other person in the Bible, uh, second to Jesus, he is the most studied person that scholars and pastors and pretty much anybody looks at for a number of reasons because they either one like him or two, maybe they don't, but um, that's for a different day to discuss. So who is Paul, right? Interesting enough, what we know about Paul only comes from three sources, which you're going to want to know, right? You need to know this. So only three sources. The first one, the autobiographical parts of his letters, which we will find and see through, uh, throughout these lectures. His authorized biography found in the book of Acts. So we have his letters and we have Acts, which describes a little bit about Paul and kind of his background. And then we also have his unauthorized biography found in such apocryphal writings as the Acts of Paul, and Thessala. Now, what is apocryphal, you might ask, or apocryphal? Uh, apocryphal. Uh, well, you're going to need to know this. Apocrypha means doubtful authenticity, although widely circulated, circulated as being true. In biblical literature, the word identifies works outside the canon of scripture. The history of the term's usage indicates that it referred to a body of obscure writings that were at first prized and then later tolerated with and then finally excluded altogether. So what do we mean then by outside the canon of scripture? Well, canon, you're going to want to know this as well. Canon means a collection or a list of sacred books accepted as genuine, right? That is, they are widely distributed. Um, tradition states that these are the books that they are written by uh, trustworthy people, and they have trustworthy information inside them. So when it comes to these three sources, when uh, according to Paul's life, right, scholars like to give preference to his own writings, which kind of makes sense, right? If he's the one that wrote it and he's writing about himself, uh, we're going to take that more to heart than we would something outside of that, right? Um, Acts then comes in second. It's an outside source that talks about Paul, and it's trustworthy according to tradition. Tra uh, according to tradition. And a lot of reasons why they accept Acts is because Acts portrays Paul in a literary sense um, where his primary interests are theological and not necessarily historical. So Acts is portraying Paul not in a way to say, hey, Paul was five foot eight, he had brown hair, blue eyes, you know, 
not the details, right? Not that he was born on this day, died on this day, but the fact that we're talking about theological um, interest. Um, so like everything else in the Bible, it's not necessarily dependent upon being uh, historical in the same sense that we would think about it, right? Where it's uh, objective fact. So when it comes to the outside books, scholar, scholars have less confidence in them because they are years, we're talking many years removed from the life of Paul. And the fact is a lot of these other writings get like their core characteristics of Paul from Acts. Um, and then they mix in a little bit of legend in there because, of course, when you have somebody like Paul who's proclaiming the gospel, people kind of uh, embellish right his stories. And so you add in a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, and then also why these outside sources aren't recognized is because many of them, even though they're different, they're very redundant or very useless when it comes to portraying the life of Paul. So redundant is, right, we have five sources that might say exactly the same thing about Paul. So you don't really know if that's true or not just because they're copying and pasting each other. All right, it'd be a little different if these sources were not copy and paste. And I say that in a sense of, right, almost word for word, what they're saying um, seems like they just copied one other person. And then sometimes these embellishments are just so outrageous, uh, like Paul being superhuman, that it's like, okay, well, this is probably not trustworthy. So what do we know for sure about Paul? One second. There we go. Sorry. Well, Paul was likely born around 5 to 10 CE in Tarsus, a city in the Roman province of Cilicia, um, which was considered modern-day Turkey. He was born into a Jewish family belonging to the tribe of Benjamin. We get that from Philippians, I believe. Or is it? Yeah, you know what? I'm not even going to go there. I, I can find it later for us if you have that question, but he does tell us that he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, he was given the Hebrew name Saul, which we will read about in Acts, or you have read about in Acts, that his original name was Saul, and then later on he becomes Paul. Um, and Paul is simply just the Greek name of Saul, so it's not like a complete change. Paul is also a Roman citizen. We get that from Acts 22, verses 25 through 29. Thus, it is believed his father was probably a Roman uh, citizen, right? Because citizenship was passed down through the father. And since he had a new mission after his transformation, right, with Christ, he then took on the Greek name Paul, um, separating himself, of course, from the Hebrews because he used his Hebrew name uh, for many years because that was the route he took. But now because he's on this new mission where he is going to be the missionary to the Gentiles, uh, he, he tries to be more relatable by changing his name to the Greek version, which is Paul. Um, Paul received a great education in the Jewish law and traditions with a good amount of knowledge in Greek philosophy and culture as well. So we probably think he was well, his family was well off in the fact that he was well educated. And when you went to school, as I mentioned before, you usually trained under somebody who was like a philosopher. Uh, and so he knew Greek philosophy very well and Greek culture for that fact. It is believed that this education was given to him under the guidance of Rabbi Gamaliel. Um, and this is a famous, famous rabbi. You can Google him. Uh, you might find his son, Rabbi Gamaliel Jr. Um, they kind of came, of course, right after each other. But uh, the first one, Sr., was like right around when Paul was born. And so people speculate maybe it was the son because he started gaining popular popularity around the time that Paul is writing his letters. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't he didn't grow up under the senior and then maybe was friends with the junior, right? That's all speculation, of course, but you can go ahead and Google that person if you'd like to just get more knowledge 
of where we hear uh, where Popeye got his education. And why do we think this? Well, Acts 22 verse 3 kind of gives us this hint. Um, and more to Rabbi Gamaliel, uh, well-renowned master of the oral law, and president of the Sanhedrin. So he is president of the Sanhedrin. And you might be going, well, what is the Sanhedrin? Well, Sanhedrin, which you're going to need to know, means Greek council or the Supreme Jewish Court. I mean, that's, of course, taking it into nowadays terminology, right? Um, there were 71 sages that met in the Jerusalem temple to discuss political, religious, and uh Judicial, uh, Judea, judicial, thank you, topics or issues. Um, there are also small councils as well, but this was the big council. The Sanhedrin is the big council. So when you think of the definition of Sanhedrin, think of council, right? Jewish council um, that met in the temple. You have those three parts, you'll be good. Paul interesting enough, was a Pharisee and a tent maker, which a tent maker was a very popular trade in the hometown that he grew up in. So it would make sense that he was a tent maker, especially if, you know, he learned from his father, who was Roman, who lived in this town, and tent making was kind of the profession. Um, so what does it mean to be a Pharisee then? Well, you're going to need to know this as well. A Pharisee, right? Um, let me see if I have these definitions for you before I forget. Here we go. Sorry. <clears throat> a Pharisees is a Jewish religious set, or the Pharisees, not a Pharisees. The Pharisees are a Jewish religious sect that believed in following the written law, right? That is the five books of Moses. Um, and we talked about that quite a bit. So that was what they believed, right? Uh, five, five books of Moses. Yeah, we follow that. And they also follow the oral law and traditions, what does that mean? Well, we've talked about this before. It's the teachings of the prophets and other traditions that were passed along, that were um, probably traditions that were included by rabbis. Um, and the Pharisees controlled the synagogues, right? They had priests, but the priests weren't in charge of the synagogues. It was actually these Pharisees that kind of uh, had a, a power hold on the synagogues, as you, as you uh, as we could say. And also it's good to note that the Pharisees are actually a holiness tradition in the sense that they upheld uh, everybody to the priestly standard, right? And that's why we see a lot of the uh, the cleanliness laws. So they really put everybody to a high standard. And this is why also Jesus talks about uh, comparing people to the Pharisees because of that high standard that they did set for themselves though it was never really commanded. Um, argument for a different day, right? And the Pharisees is a sect compared to another sect, which is the Sadducees. And you need to know the Sadducees as well. The Sadducees only believed that they should follow the five books of, of Moses as true authority, right? The prophets and all the traditions. Yeah, you know, those were good things to live by, but... The five books of Moses, like that is true authority. That was what came from the word, uh, the mouth of God, and we need to follow it. The Sadducees were, <clears throat> were often associated with the priestly class and the aristocracy. Uh, they held positions of authority within the temple and were closely connected to the religious and political establishment of their time. Right, So they are more along the lines of the political side as well. Um, so we have these two sects. You have the Sanhedrin, which kind of oversaw everything, uh, and the Sadducees and Pharisees kind of fought each other out. The Sadducees were more well-known before the fall of the Second Temple, and then the Pharisees kind of became the well-known ones after the fall of the Second Temple. And that's why you're going to hear a lot more about the Pharisees in the Gospel stories over the Sadducees. Even though, if we're reading about Jesus' life, the Sadducees were probably around more in strength than the Pharisees. But when you're writing in context of 40 years later and the Pharisees are taking over, you know, you might be writing about them because of current situations. <sighs> Paul was also a zealous person, right? Um, 
And that is in the sense of he's enthusiastic for his cause, right? He is so about being a Pharisee that he looks at everybody else and if you're Jewish, you need to be following their ways. And he believes so much so that he persecuted Christians for not following the law, persecuting literally. Like, he not only tried to take them to court, but he, in some cases, watched their death, like in the case of Stephen, right? That comes from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. We see, you read that Saul is in the background that gives the permission to uh, do the killing. Paul then is converted and commissioned by Jesus to be a prophetic teacher. This comes from Acts 9, verses 1 through 16. Following his encounter with Christ, Paul becomes a um, just on fire, if you will, uh, for Christ. And he becomes a great follower of Jesus and one of the most prominent advocates for the spread of Christianity, right? We believe that he did a lot of spreading. He planted a lot of churches. Yet, because he was not an original follower of Christ, like the other disciples, some viewed Paul not on the same level. And as you may have read already about Paul, uh, he seems defensive about his authority when he's writing his letters. So he sometimes compares his authority to others' authority. Uh, and this could be the case because the other apostles didn't see him quite on level because he was somebody that was an outsider who didn't walk with Jesus, right? He came on the team later. So Paul then writes 13 letters, <clears throat> which we're going to go through some of those. Uh, we're going to go through all of them pretty quickly, but we'll go through those later. Um, tradition believes that Paul was executed in Rome around 64 to 67 CE during the reign of Emperor Nero. However, the exact circumstances of his death are not recorded in historical sources. Paul played um, a crucial role in the development of early Christian communities, contributing significantly to the spread of the faith beyond its Jewish origins. Uh, his theological contributions, like we, we should have been reading, right, have had a continuation and shape our modern theological views. Uh, we, You all wrote about this, actually, when we talked about Romans chapter 5, right? You all played into uh, Paul's hand and talking about the theological views of how Jesus came to save people and how that kind of worked out. So right there, even if you're not someone who goes to church, you were doing theology with Paul, uh, and you're wrestling with things that he was talking about. Although most Jews during this time, even Paul, would have been reading the Septuagint. <clears throat> what is the Septuagint? You're going to need to know that. Septuagint equals the Greek. Uh, hold on, let me get the slide going. <clears throat> is Greek. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. That's what you need to know. Don't worry about the extra stuff that I put in there for Septuagint, right? Latin for 70? No, you don't need it. It is Latin for 70, and that's because there were 70 people, uh, sages that came together to put this together, and they did it in 70 days. Like, and 70, of course, right? Holy number. But that's not as important as it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. You need to know that. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. <sighs> um, so, well, I have my notes here. So, it's Latin for 70 because it is said that it was written <clears throat> in 72 days. So they just took off two days, right? Rounded at 70. Uh, it was authored in the third sec third or second century BC. Uh, so before Jesus, right? It was commissioned to be written and placed in the library of Alexandria. And of course, we don't have that anymore because what happened to the library of Alexandria? It burned to the ground. So a lot of actual books are lost because of that burning. But tradition states that 72 Jewish scholars, six from each tribe, were selected to undertake the translation task, right? So they sat there and made sure that everything was perfect. The importance of this work was because most Jews no longer were fluent in Hebrew. As you, as I mentioned earlier, right, third semester, the Greeks kind of ruled this area for quite a long time. And then it became Roman. And so they still had that Hellenistic tradition, right? Um, and so this new 
this new writing or this translation, I should say, then of course includes a lot of Hellenistic culture to make um, to make the uh, the Hebrew themes. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. To make the Hebrew themes more relatable to the Greek audience because most of the people aren't Hebrews anymore. I mean, they still like they're Hebrew. But it's like when you move to America, you just become more American, right? And that's what happened to the Jews at this time. Yet, Paul's theology is not shaped by the Greco-Roman religious culture, nor through some innovation he came up with. But it is reflective of his Jewish background, right? So even when he's writing the New Testament letters, he's still has a reflection of his Jewish background. Nevertheless, his theology challenged the traditional Jewish beliefs by including Jesus into the being of God and being a part of God's promised salvation. Thus, as we will see in his letters, Paul connects Christ's story with the Old Testament to show Jesus as Lord, as to show Jesus as Lord, right? The Messiah. And that Gentiles are now included in the elect people of God. It is no longer just the Hebrews, but it is the Gentiles as well. Interestingly, Paul never talks too much, right, um, about the details of Jesus' life. And he only quotes Jesus twice in all of his letters. He instead seems to be hyper-focused on the grand themes of Jesus' life, and connecting them to the Old Testament and then interpreting them for the people he is writing to as a way to live. So already we see that when Paul's writing these letters, he's interpreting Jesus' life and he's interpreting the Old Testament. And then he's taking these things together and he's trying to tie a nice bow on it. It's saying, here's how we're supposed to have faith. Here's how we are supposed to live, right? Um. And I didn't change the slide for you guys, but you don't need to memorize any of this. This is just uh, me kind of talking and having the bullet points up. <clears throat> so what are some of these big themes that we're talking about, right? There's a lot that can be attributed to Paul's theology, theological work. So we're only going to go over a few things here. big one that he, he had a big part in was justification by faith. Right? Paul emphasizes that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ rather than through adherence to the Mosaic Law. This theological stance articulated in Romans and Galatians becomes a foundational principle for the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, if you don't know who Martin Luther is, go look it up. He's kind of a boss. Uh, he's kind of a crazy uh, person a little bit if you go into like some of the moral stuff that comes about later. Um, but of course... You, you take the good with the bad, right? Um, but he was one of the great leaders of moving us away from the Catholic tradition, and he's kind of where we get the start to have Protestantism. Protestantism? Protestantism? That's the word I'm looking for. And that all started with the Protestant Reformation. And it sparked the Reformation, and it declared that justification by faith alone is the article on which the church stands or falls. And, of course, he was arguing because the church was trying to sell... Um, indulgences where they would forgive sins of the dead and then the dead can get out of hell and go to heaven. Um, it was very lucrative, right? Because they made a lot of money. And so he was like, no, this isn't the way. Justification by faith alone is how you get to heaven. And so that sparked the whole revolution. Yet Paul grapples with the role of the Mosaic Law in the life of a Christian community. While affirming the law's significance in the history of God's covenant with Israel, he argues that adherence to the law is not the basis for justification. Christ's sacrifice fulfills the law's requirements, bringing freedom and a new covenant. He then talks about um, grace and redemption. This is another, another big theme he has in Paul underscores the idea of God's grace as a source of salvation, right? In Ephesus, in Ephesians, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, he famously writes, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
and I know we've all heard that, right? It's through faith alone, right? And this is what most people will quote when it comes to the argument of faith over works. And we're all like, yeah, makes sense. However, most people stop reading Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 at verse 9. But Paul is still talking. Remember we talked about taking things out of context? Well, here you go. If all we did was read the next verse, verse 10, it states, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So we're prepared for good works because God prepared us for it so that we would do it. So it's not that we don't have works. We do. But it's that we have works works because God gave it to us and we're able to do these works because we trust in Jesus, right? That's the whole concept of faith alone. But most people, some people will say, well, faith alone is all we need. We don't actually need to do good things. And if we recall from last week's conversation, um, we read the separation of the sheep and the goats, and in there we saw good actions uh, occurring as well, right? So here's another one supporting that. Um. Paul's theology also emphasizes, uh, when it comes to grace and redemption, that genuine faith is active and transformative, right? In Galatians 5, 6, he writes, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. There's love again. We talked about that quite a bit. Faith, according to Paul, is inseparable from a life characterized by love and good works. Another thing we have uh, from Paul is the body of Christ. And he says this quite a bit. He talks about the body of Christ. Paul frequently uses the metaphor of the body of Christ to describe the unity and diversity within the Christian community. In 1 Corinthians 12, he compares believers to different parts of the body, uh, of a body, I should say, emphasizing the interdependence and shared purpose that the church has, right? We need each other in order to stand. We don't just stand because of certain parts of the body, right? We don't just need pastors to stand. We don't just need congregations to stand. We need every single person with all their gifts that they have in order for the church to thrive. And that's what he calls the body of Christ. Then we also get another theme of ethics and Christian living. Paul addresses various ethical concerns in his letters, providing guidance on how Christians should live in light of their faith. Right? If you're a Christian and you have faith, then you should probably follow that faith by living it out in your life. Um, his ethical teachings uh, cover areas such as love, humility, forgiveness, and moral conduct. Right? We call these the fruits of the spirits, which is found in Galatians 5, uh, verses 22 through 23. And it encapsulates some of these ethical virtues that also play into it. Let's see. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop here, um, and I'm going to do another video to kind of wrap this lecture up. Uh, so it'll be pretty short, and then we'll do another video for the lecture that we were supposed to have today. So stay tuned, stay with me, and we'll pick up with Paul's themes here in a minute.